Hey everyone, this is Daniel and in today's video we're going to focus on strategies for official email accounts with Power Automate. And as a full disclosure, this is a very Microsoft centric video which means I will not be looking at email options that other cloud services such as Google or Amazon may have to offer. So I'm going to break this down into two categories. Category one is at no additional cost and these are the options that are available. And strategy number two, well, there is a little bit of cost involved, but even over there, I'll show you how you can save some money. So stick around. This is very important, whether you are a new company coming to adopt the Microsoft Cloud, especially the M365 services, or an existing company and just trying to figure out where I can save some money as well. But first, here's my intro video. So let's start with category number one, which includes three options and all of them require no additional cost. And the first one is shared mailbox. And the beautiful thing about that mailbox is yes, you gotta go ahead and create on your exchange service, but creating that mailbox does not require an additional license. So that's one of the first things I wanna take a look at because it's a beautiful thing, but it needs some extra configuration with either you know, your Office 365 admins or your exchange admins. They are the ones who have access to do all of this. And we've gotta make sure that they do it correctly. So here I am in my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. I've actually signed in as an Exchange Admin, which means somebody who has exclusive access to all those Exchange Admin roles that are available in Azure Active Directory. And so once I come in over here in my Admin Center, the one that at least the Exchange Admin should see is the Exchange one. So when I go and click on Exchange, you will see everything that the Exchange Admin Center has to provide. But what I want you to do is go ahead and take a look at the mailboxes, all right? And so in the mailboxes, you will see what you're normally already seeing over here. You see the display name, email addresses, but here is the recipient type. And when you go and take a look at the recipient type, there's actually two options. There's something called as a shared mailbox and a user mailbox. And it's the shared mailbox that you wanna see. And if it, for some reason, if you wanna actually go and quickly find out, I just wanna see all the shared mailbox, click on the filter on the top right, and then select the shared mailbox option, and then voila, you only see your shared mailbox. And again, as a reminder, to create the shared mailbox, that shared mailbox does not require any additional license. No license is needed for this service to take effect. So I'll just quickly even show you something. Right away here on the top, you see that plus add a shared mailbox. That's what you're gonna use to create that shared mailbox. You go ahead and select it. This option will slide off on the right and then you go ahead and provide all this information. Uh, just keep in mind that your company might have these multiple domains type selected. So just select what it is that you want. Um, I'm gonna only have one option, uh, but in my personal tenant, for example, I have two options over there and I just make sure that I select the one which is tied to my actual domain name. Uh, so my domain name is christianfamily.biz. So I will have a account such as Imagination Unlimited at christianfamily.biz. Make sense? All right, so you can do all of that over here. Display name, the actual email address, and you can also put in some alias names as well. So it's literally as simple as that, and then you go and click on create. Uh, one thing I have noticed is from the time you create this shared mailbox, it actually does take a few hours for that one to show up, say, when you're building a Power Automate flow. Now each tenant behaves differently. If you're a large enterprise level tenant, lots of these accounts, it does take a while for that creation of the mailbox over here to propagate through all your services and show up on your Power Automate flows as well. Now for some of you, it may be really fast as well. So just keep that in mind. There is a minor delay. This is all fine, but it does happen. So here I am with my shared mailbox. It is imagination.unlimited at and then whatever is the name that you've assigned for your tenant. It's a shared mailbox. So now I'm gonna actually select this mailbox and if you click on top of it directly, you will see that this option, all the properties slides out from the right side. And over here, this is where you've got to make that additional configuration because say, if you've got the creator of the flow and now the flow needs to go ahead and send an email notification using the shared mailbox, well, whoever is the one creating that flow, that person also needs access to the mailbox and access, the technical term for that from an exchange standpoint is delegation. So again, in the properties, you see these tabs, there is general, organization, ah, there is delegation. So select that delegation tab and now here are the two options available. And if you start reading it, it tends to make sense automatically, is that you wanna send this as, and then you also wanna read and man manage it as. 
Now the focus for us is going to be primarily on this top option is send as and let's actually read what it says. It said that send as permission allows the delegate to send an email from this mailbox and then the message will appear to the send as if it's the mailbox owner. So here we go. I'm going to click on edit and in the edit you've got the option to actually add the members over here. So what this really means is that this user, for example, there's an already an existing user. The first name is Irvin. Irvin has access to send emails on behalf of this mailbox. And that will actually make more sense in a few minutes because I'll show you the Power Automate flow and there's an action for that. But prior to that, you've got to come over here and make that setting change. So I've already got Irvin over here, but say if I also have to give access to Lydia. Well, how do I do that? Pretty simple. You need to come over here. Well, you means the exchange admin needs to come over here. Click on the add plus members and then over here you can just click do a search search. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and search for Lydia. That's what it is. Lydia. I'll select Lydia and then I'll go and click on save and then I'll go and say continue. And the moment it says continue, it'll actually say mailbox permissions were added to this mailbox and read this message it's like selected users have been added successfully. The changes are saved and will appear within five minutes. So it appears over here on the exchange side in five minutes, but it can take some additional time for you to start using all of the settings directly in your Power Automate flow, especially with that Outlook connector. So give it some extra time, you know, however you feel right for your tenant and you'll understand that very well when you start using it. It could just take a few hours. Sometimes you just want to wait for an entire day uh, so that everything synchronizes well across all your M365 services. But this is how you do the setup. Now I know that when I went back over here, we said that there was two options, send as, and then there's also read and manage. Uh, this is the one if you actually want to open up that mailbox. So say for example, you have your exchange mailbox, which is your Outlook, and over there you want to see the other option, which is, hey, what are all the emails coming in for Imagination Unlimited? Well, if you want to do that, you want to read it, you want to manage it, then make sure that Lydia is also added over here. And the process is pretty same. Click on the edit, go to plus add members, add Lydia over here, save it, give it all that extra time and that's great. But for our scenario, when it comes to actually setting out those official emails using Power Automate, uh, that's the one, send on behalf of, that's the important one over here. So this is the first option of how to do it in Exchange. I do want to quickly show you how you can translate the service over to Power Automate. So let's go take a look at that. So here I am in my Power Automate flow and I already have a little bit of the scenario created. Here is a SharePoint list and when an item is added to this list, that is what triggers this flow. So there's a SharePoint site and the list is travel requests. As the name suggests, this is where somebody goes and submits their travel request and it goes ahead and triggers this flow. So after that, I go ahead and grab the user's profile. The user's profile comes in from the requester's email address. And then this user's profile also helps me grab the actual manager of this user's because the email notification is going to go to this manager. All right, so now that I have the shared mailbox done, let's go and leverage that over here. Uh, so I'll just go and minimize some of this so you can actually see the entire other actions. And in the plus new step, I just go ahead and do a search for Outlook. That's what I do. And then in Outlook, I select the Office 365 Outlook. And then once I do that, all I'm going to do is I can scroll down and search for it. Um, on the top, I can just do a search for send. And when I do that, here is the option, send an email from a shared mailbox. So now when I click on it, this is where I go ahead and put in all that information. So on the original mailbox address, that is our shared mailbox one. So you can actually just come over here and just put in the entire email address. The action will go ahead and verify, hey, okay, yeah, this is the correct one, Imagination Unlimited. I found it in your tenant. Now I select on it. And so the email will be sent on behalf of this Imagination Unlimited. And then after that, you can go ahead and put in all this other information. So right over here, I can go and do the get manager's name. I can go ahead and put in the subject. I can go ahead and put in the body. But the email now doesn't come from a specific user. It comes from the shared mailbox. And remember, this is one of those functionalities where you can go and do that free of cost, no additional price over here. So this is one of the options over here, which is using a shared mailbox. Option number two is using a SharePoint HTTP action. So let's go and take a look at that. Now, the good thing about this action is that it is a SharePoint connectors action. So even though you heard me say that this is a send with HTTP, you might have heard that HTTP and you might have freaked out. It's like, oh, HTTP, which means I need a premier connector and all that. No, 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 no. This is still a SharePoint connection, which is a standard connector. In that connector, there is an action and that action has got the send with HTTP and I'll show you that in a minute. So your takeaway is that this does not need a premier connection. You are still good to go with your standard SharePoint connection. 
But one of the things you want to be planning for is because when you use them, it actually leverages your SharePoint site name. So in this example, I actually have a SharePoint online site and it's called as Innovation Technology. And so when I'm sending out these emails on behalf of the SharePoint, this title will be used, Innovation Technology. So keep that in mind. Just don't just go ahead and use any SharePoint site, uh, which might have a name that doesn't make any sense uh, because that can sometimes affect the end users. So here is my SharePoint site, and this is actually one of my Power Automate flow. Now, I've also got another video which walks you through this step by step. And so I've put that link down in the description below because I was doing some side by side comparisons of the SharePoint with Send HTTP with the mail connector. So I've taken that entire video and put it down there and that walks you through it step by step. But at least I want to give you the overall effect over here. So again, it's a Power Automate flow. It is already going and has, starting off with the trigger when the item is created. Uh, so this is what it is. You're familiar with that. Uh, but now when you go and click on you know, a plus new step, and I'll just reenact this so you actually see it. When you come over here, you search for SharePoint. When you select the SharePoint option, after that, you can go and scroll down or you can go ahead and just type in send and that will give you the send an HTTP request to SharePoint. That is the one that you want. And sometimes the title doesn't make sense because hey, it's not about me sending them something to SharePoint. I actually want something from SharePoint. I get it. But still go ahead and use this action, which is send an HTTP request to SharePoint. Uh, because after you do that, what it is that you're going to do is this. You're going to get this format. So over there, first thing you do is you put in the site address, all right? So that's basically the URL that you got over here. That is your site address. Don't do anything after that, like settings and all of that, a list name. No, we don't want that. We don't want library name. No, we want the root site address right up to over here. And then you want to go and say that this is a method to post. This is something that SharePoint is posting, providing to the end user, all right? And then here you go. These are some of the things you can literally copy and paste it. So what you see over here, you literally copy that and paste it into that action. It is that simple. Now the body, well, that does take a little bit of attention to go ahead and post this in. So you have to go ahead and put it in this format. There is no workaround over that. You've got to do it. Granted, I know some people have done this ways where they actually go ahead and take all of this stuff and put it in a variable. That's actually brilliant because then if for any things you have to make any changes, you haven't lost any work. Uh, you can go ahead and actually just put all the body directly from that variable and move it. So you could do that as well. But in my example, I've actually gone and done it this way. And so then I'll be able to do the send the two. I'll be able to go ahead and send the subject, the body, all of that actually works and it works really well. And the email comes on behalf of SharePoint and it'll come as if it's coming from this innovation technology site. That's basically the name that we'll do. But this is the overall way, and this is the second best way, no additional license required, and you already have access to this. So now, let's go and take a look at the third way. So the third option is to go ahead and use the mail connector. And if that mail connector has been approved in your data loss prevention policy for your Power Platform, then all you do is you come to the scenario after the trigger has been done, you click on the plus new step, on the top you just search for mail, and this is what it is. It's called the mail connector, uh, and then this is the action, which is send an email. Uh, once you create it, this is something I want you to pay attention to. Because even on the Microsoft's website, when you go and do a search for standard connectors, you see mail, mail over here is written by my Microsoft. Well, they are just the ones who actually built the connector. But the overall flow, the backend of the flow, is actually sent to SendGrid. What that means is that SendGrid will actually be receiving that emails that you use for the mail connector. Other thing, is if your company is heavily regulated and you need the option to go ahead and do electronic discovery or e-discovery uh, to see, hey, I wanna go ahead and investigate some of these emails, you cannot run e-discovery for this mail connector. That option is just not there. Uh, so be very, very mindful of using this mail collector. In fact, keep it as your last resort uh, and even for a very short amount of times for those email notifications that you just don't care about, right? This is the time, only time that you use this mail connector. Uh, so after you go and do that, go ahead and select accept. And then once you do it, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is to subject and email and the email actually comes from power apps. It doesn't come from a user. It doesn't come from any of your shared mailbox. It just directly comes from this one place. Um, about that mail connector, 
there again is some limitations. So here we are again in this Microsoft documentation and it says that it's throttling limits. Throttling limits is basically just its overall capacity. How much can this connector handle? Uh, so it is able to have five calls every 300 seconds. So overall it can basically handle only up to so many emails, five calls every 300 seconds. But check out the Outlook connector. It's able to handle 300 calls every 60 seconds. This 300 every 60 seconds is much better than this five every 300 seconds. So again, keep your mail connector as the absolute last resort. I highly, highly recommend not using it, but if you are in that scenario where you absolutely, absolutely have to use it, then keep it for those scenarios where you just don't care about because it's set up this way, all right? Something that you need to be aware of. All right, so we've seen these three options for the first category. Now we're gonna switch gears and take a look at the category number two, which does have an additional cost, and I'll also end that with some ways to save you money. So the first option with the additional cost is to go ahead and create another account altogether and make it behave like a user account, but it actually is a service account. And some companies, instead of service account, they call it as an application account, uh, which means it's not really tied to a user, but you use it for everyday user type of stuff, which means you sign in as an account, you go ahead and create apps, you go ahead and create flows, which means you go ahead and create all of those connectors using that account. And even over here, see, I'm in my Azure AD, you can see that I've got all of these other user accounts and they're classified as a member. But right over here, you see I have automated hotel response. Well, that is a service account or an application account, but it is also of a type member. So from a system standpoint, it doesn't really look at it as a human versus non-human. Um, it actually still takes your application or your service account as a member, as a user. But the only thing over here is that you have to go ahead and pay that additional license. Now, if you purchase licenses in bulk, uh, then going ahead and consuming one of those might just be easier for you because you already got that. But here's the point. Uh, if you went and purchased, say, a whole bunch of E3s, the Microsoft 365 Enterprise E3s or E5s, then you're consuming an E3 or an E5 license tied to one of these accounts. And you might only be doing that to send and receive email notifications. So in essence, it almost feels like, man, I have wasted that money to do so little, uh, but just because of consuming that service account, like a non-user account. Uh, but either way, this is one full way you can go and sign in with that account and you can do everything that I just showed you uh, using an Outlook connector, going in and sending out stuff, automation, everything can be done with that. So that's option number one is to go ahead and just pay that additional amount. But now that you've heard me talk about this, I want to show you the option number two is to do it a little bit cheaper. And for that, let's take a look at some of these plans that are available. So I showed you the example of using the E5 and E5, there is a dollar amount to it. Okay, that's a sticker price. You might be paying something else using your Microsoft account, but either way, that is what your E5 looks like. So if you are in that scenario, consider dropping it down. When I say that scenario, that you want to use a service account, a non-user account, an application account, but still have all the flexibility, maybe go a step down. Instead of the E5s, go to an E1, because check this out, your E1, still has all the flexibility to go ahead and use that Outlook connector. So you can do this. In fact, you can go one more step down. You can see these Office 365 front line licenses. These are called as F licenses. Now you cannot, I repeat, you cannot go as low as an F1. You have to start with an F3. But hey, that is much cheaper than that E1 that I just showed you. And that also comes with the exchange service option over there. So this is something that you can consider. Yes, you wanna pay. Yes, you wanna go ahead and use all that Excel service and connectors, but you wanna do it a little cheaper? Well, go with some license like this. And this is just one of the examples, the frontline license, and you have to start with at least an F3 license. So one thing to keep in mind is that I kept using Power Automate as an example, but the exact same things apply to Power Apps as well. Because remember, both Power Automate and Power Apps use the same connectors that are available to you in your environment as allowed by a data loss prevention policy. And hopefully these ideas helped you because I broke it down into two different categories and even in the categories, I gave you some options. So hopefully this video has been helpful to you and as always, keep using the Power Platform. Hello, hello, hello. So if you like this video, go ahead and click on that subscribe button and smash that like button. Also, if you have a few extra seconds, can you go and put in a comment, either say something nice or give me ideas for my next video. And until then, see ya.